If a masked maniac quietly killed off all the staff at your company retreat and then came for your bumbling co-workers, what would you do? Probably nothing, since all the office co-workers I've ever had would have used me as a human shield before slipping in my guts onto the killer's blade, rendering my involuntary sacrifice worthless. These people make my past co-workers seem almost competent, which is the true horror. If we hope to survive, we're gonna have to show some upper management initiative. I'm going to break down the mistakes made. What you should do is how to beat the sooty slasher in the conference. Our group of fawning office stereotypes and rejects have arrived at this semi-isolated region of Sweden for a work retreat. Their company has finally bulldozed its way through local regulations, farmers, and small business owners to build a new shopping center, which they boast will host an Ikea and bring thousands of families and jobs to the nearest town. Great news for HR nightmare Angela, the John Draper wannabe project manager Jonas, and his personal ball washer Kai. Everyone else? Well, you could weigh their collective enthusiasm against a feather. Most are just there for the free food, which is a shame because the cook Carl is a little preoccupied. The only relatable person in this group is Lena, who's back after a several months long mental health break. And only the co-worker who wants to bang her, Amir, is happy she's back. It isn't long before she realizes something's wrong. Companies destroyed a family's farm to make way for the mall and paid them nothing for the land. You signed the contract yourself. Sure, it's my signature, but it's the wrong contract. I wouldn't have signed this. Jonas is quick to corner her after and imply she's crazy for forgetting she signed it and embarrassing him. Jonas is plenty embarrassing on his own. He dresses up in a custom forest gnome big boy costume for the project mascot, Sudi, while someone else is shish kebabbing the camp's maintenance guy. As the team gears up for a competitive team building exercise, Lena pries for more information about the forms she didn't sign, saying they need to pay the farmer no matter what happened. But Amir reveals the farmer unalived himself after they bulldozed his livelihood. Looks like that loose end to tie itself up. Nearby, the killer steals the sooty mask and breaks the camp's Wi-Fi router before forcing the camp manager into early retirement. Bravo, that was a d fine attempt to escape death. The knife throw was solid, blocking the path was great, except you know what I'm gonna say. Retreat really only works when you can fully exit your pursuer's line of sight and never turn your back on your attacker. The killer threw his machete seconds after she nailed him with that knife. She should have picked it up. In the kitchen, evasion is great, but you are surrounded by potential weapons, including that heavy cast iron skillet he used to bash your brains in. Remember your go-tos for throwing off their stability, eyes and groin. Spill cooking oil to take them off balance. You're looking for a couple of seconds of distraction to flee or kill. Outside, the team is none the wiser. They're off building garbage boats, racing in potato sacks and zip lining. It's just like camp, except it sucks because you're with the worst people you know. Under the mewling peer pressure of her unsupportive team, Lena bows out of zip lining in favor of breaking into Jonas's room room to snoop, since he's the type of genius who taped his laptop password to the bottom of said laptop, it ain't exactly a challenge. She finds proof that he pressured the farm to give away his land, and copies it right before the group returns, forcing her to hide under his bed until he's gone. Meanwhile, the killer preps a slew of traps and tricks like he's really gunning for that slasher merit badge. Honestly, he doesn't need to work this hard. This lot's more concerned that their phones are missing than the camp's missing employees. Their activities director is the only one who notices, following a blood trail to the walk-in freezer. <laughs> Once again, we have an almost winner. Solid evasion for a few seconds, but she doesn't grab a single weapon as she runs. You know who does? The killer, who pulls a literal mallet off a wall of random weapons and knocks her freaking lights out. Small note here, if the doors are locked, try smashing the windows out while everyone is indulging in 
touching skin, an HR violation if I've ever heard one, Lena lures Amir and another co-worker, Nadia, away. She reveals everything she found on Jonas's computer. Not just that he forged her signature to evict the farmer, but that no stores want to be out here, and Jonas is planning to betray everyone for a better job. I, for one, am shocked. Well, not really. What does shock me is that she confronts Jonas right then and there with everything, and then agrees to meet with Bug Eyes in private where he strips naked, tells her he thinks she's one smart cookie, then offers her a job at the company that's hiring him. Yeah, we're not doing any of this. No alone time with the office perv, no confronting him in an isolated location, and definitely no showing him the evidence we've stolen. Moron. I don't care that we've exposed him in front of everybody. I trust these people the way I trust cockroaches. The feast on my flesh after I'm dead. If you reveal any of this, wait to do it in front of the cameras at the groundbreaking. Or take a car and leave. It's not like you're keeping your job after this anyway. Kai and another worker, Annette, get stupid drunk near the jacuzzi. Watching through hooded lids as Sudi tries to start a pull motor nearby. The soaking hemorrhoid Kai is too out of it to run when Sudi comes out after him. Oh look, it's a bloodbath. At least Annette has the sense to run. There's a few options here, which we'll go over in time. The obvious one is walking straight to your cabin, grabbing your keys and bouncing, or at least double checking that that's not an option. In the main building, Ingela finds a crime scene where she immediately touches evidence. Human teeth, to be precise. I mean, just why? And then runs outside toward the killer because she thinks it's Jonas still wearing wearing his costume. <sighs> The killer happily wraps a cord around her neck and hoists her up the flagpole. <laughs> this one's tough. Flag cord is usually made out of polyester, which you can cut with any old knife. Use a sharp ring if you have one. But if you make it all the way up the flagpole, your last option is to wrap or wedge your body in relation to the pole to take a tension off your neck. You'll have less than 10 seconds to do it. You only need 4.4 pounds of pressure on the jugular to black out. The rest of the team spots Sudi hoisting her up and runs, missing the axe, laying right there, which the killer picks up as he chases after them. For some bizarre reason, Lena runs after Jonas, straight into a forest full of garrot wires. Jonas slams into one at top speed, nearly scalping himself. <laughs> Lena pulls him to his feet as the killer pursues. Back at camp, the others try the barricade trick, which I've mentioned before. It is a solid option if you do it correctly, which they do not. This is the main building, which has too many blind corners to be safe, too many windows to block. The littler cabins aren't much better though. Even if you could make one of them totally unbreachable, which I doubt, he'd probably just burn it down with you inside, which means we could lay a trap for him inside a lock cabin and then set him on fire. While barricading, you should be looking for keys and weapons as well, obviously. And honestly, if you just pay attention to which way he ran, you could slip out of camp into the woods while he's off chasing the others. Lena and Jonas outrun the killer to the lake, launch the garbage raft, and start paddling. But halfway across, Jonas demands Lena's hard drive, then kicks her off the boat. You see, this is why we don't show our hand to our enemies. We also don't swim him toward the shore where we know the killer's waiting. Unfortunately, she does. She runs through the woods, dodges an axe, which she doesn't grab, and narrowly avoids impalement in a punji pit where we learn what happened to Carl. In the first smart move she's made all day, Lena pulls up a spike, knocks the killer back, and uses Carl's body to pull herself out. But then she doesn't end the killer while he's down. I swear to God, I'll, I'll just root for you to die then. Back in the main building. The team has to hold an entire company meeting to discuss the plan of finding weapons before they actually look, settling on a corkscrew, fire pokers, and the blade from a paper cutter. Nadia decides she wants to run to Jonas's cabin for the keys to the minivan. No one else agrees to help her do. Meanwhile, Amir just disappears, slipping right out of this so-called barricaded building to go find Lena. Is there anyone here to root for? Sudi stalks Lena through the forest, where she's hiding until Amir runs in screaming for her like an idiot. She silences him before Sudi notices, pulling him into the dark. Back at camp, Nadia ransacks Jonas's room right before Sudi proves just how terrible windows are for defense. 
She grabs a pair of scissors in reach, but cuts her hair instead of his arm. He lets go, then reappears inside, accidentally breaking the light, plunging them all into darkness. There's a slicing sound, and Nadia emerges victorious, having hit Sudi in the shoulder. In this unique set of circumstances, landing a blow and running is fine. We're all blind without night vision in the dark. She makes it back to the main building just in time to watch Sudi blow up their getaway minivan. They hear noises and follow them to a downstairs door, which is totally unbarricaded and opens easily as Amir and Lena come in. Nearby, we learn Annette never actually left the side of the building where Kai was killed. I mean, not the worst idea if we confirm the killer actually wandered off. Under the buildings is a pretty good place to hide, especially if we can pick one with a disguised or hidden entrance. However, pro tip, if it looks like a good hiding spot to you, it probably looks like a good place to check for the killer. Jonas finds her, and they enter a cabin where they leave a light on, as bright as a lighthouse, while Annette sews the scalp back to his head. <laughs> Annette admits she thinks this is all her fault because she told another disgruntled employee named Franz who left months ago about their conference. Jonas reads this as a huge betrayal, bolts out of the cabin talking to himself. He grabs a motorized bicycle just as Sudi appears. Jonas tells Annette to push, and of course, he drags her for a quarter mile before leaving her in the dust. Aside from being an absolute a-hole, that bike is a great way to escape. It's just a shame Jonas found it. Annette faces Sudi, believing he's her friend Franz. She claims she stayed at the company to try and stop the mall build and protect the environment like he wanted. But when she removes Sudi's head, she realizes that ain't him. <laughs> Jonas keeps on trucking until he hits the board of nails we saw in Carl's tire earlier and wrecks his sh- Might I suggest breaking. The remaining office lackeys realize the killer's probably the son of the farmer that offed himself. You think? Lena rallies the group to head for the zip line, which ends on the other side of the lake, closer to the other houses, practically wearing a little neon kill me signs. They grab a random assortment of weapons and flashlights and wander into the woods as the killer watches from afar. When Eva spots him, they scatter like barn mice. Nadia hits the Nerd Explains classic bear trap as ever Everyone else abandoned, sir. Lo and behold, we have ourselves an actual survivor. The killer begins to reel her in. Armed with a rake, she whacks him across the face, then slams the broken rake handle into his eye. <laughs> Solid improvisation. Just a shame he fell where you can't finish him off. Then we get this chick. <laughs> That is the Titanic of Barricades. You didn't even close the door behind you. Another guy named Torbjorn joins her, but he's just as stupid. Amir and Lena make it to the zip line. They cast off through the fog. When it clears, Amir sees a booby trap up ahead. In his last few seconds, he turns himself midair to be Lena's human shield. <laughs> Lena takes one to the abdomen, but she survives. Amir, not so much. Runaway zip lines are obviously uncommon, either because they have hand brakes or the line is hung in a shallow U shape, which means you go up as you approach the end and slow yourself down. With two people on this one, the added weight is overpowering that mechanism. I think there's really only two ways for both of them to survive this. They're not guarantees and someone is still definitely getting hurt. The first is to Try swinging if you're far enough away to build up momentum. A swinging movement might allow you to hit the board of spikes indirectly, decreasing the direct force on your body. The second is to lower your center of gravity and stick out your leg to catch the edge of the raised platform as you approach. You'll still break your leg at best, but that's better than joining Vlad the Impaler's wall art collection. Back in the main building, the lights flicker out as someone approaches the front door. Office idiot Toy Bjorn tiptoes up and tries to speak with whomever is outside. <laughs> Neat. I mean, there's no way you wouldn't hear this before it happened, but still, cool surprise. Sudi half beats Toy Bjorn to death when Eva slices in out of nowhere with a scythe and scares him away, which is impressive for such a useless person. Unfortunately, they are as useless as they seem. Getting the crap kicked out of him only inspires Toy Bjorn's revenge, but...
As he convinces Eva, they need to end this. They open the door to the kitchen to face the killer, screaming their heads off. Sudi quietly wraps a wire around Eva's neck. She smashes a bottle over his head, then shoves them both out the window. Again, with someone more useful, this would have been solid improvisation. She runs, screaming. Sudi knocks her down. While his back is turned, Torbjorn announces his presence before setting Sudi's head on fire. Then, he and Eva just lay there, allowing Sudi to extinguish himself before he returns to finish them off. Guys, half a fight still means you die. It's not over until his head is literally across the yard, or he's so wrapped in chains he looks like J-Lo and Anaconda. Very luckily, Nadia saves them at the last second. How? By not announcing herself before attacking. <laughs> That is how it's done. Nerd Survivor of the Week over here. Lena finds their stolen phones in the woods and calls 112 and police swarm to their location. Unfortunately for her, she made the catastrophic mistake of angering the office sociopath. Unfortunately for him, she's putting in one helpful letter of resignation. <laughs> In the end, Nadia, Toybjorn, Eva, Lena, and Annette survive, which is more than half, so I think this team building exercise was a success. In the end, the killer took advantage of Jonas's mask to lure Kai and Ingela into a false sense of security. They died because their instincts and reaction times were dulled or non-existent. Jonas died a coward's death, but he and Amir would still be alive if Lena hadn't told Jonas about her evidence, or if she had spiked the killer by the punji pit when she had the chance. If you ever find yourself in an active attacker situation like this, hide, barricade, escape if you can visually confirm the killer's location and have the keys already on you, and lure him to a spot where you can kill him quickly if possible. Hand-to-hand -hand combat is not ideal, unless you have training, but if you find yourself playing fist to cuffs with your would-be killer, it ain't over until he's on a spike six feet off the ground. For those reasons, I think the conference was beat. Moral of the story, this one's dark. Kill your enemies and their children so they don't come for revenge.